Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Kanwani from Bangkok, and I'm going to moderate the session episode of the Apostle COVID-19 Weekly Webinar. This, uh, this is the second session where I have my co-moderator, Professor Jim, Jim Mo Yang from Seoul, Korea. Uh, this program is part of uh, Apostle Action in order to communicate and share the experience of dealing with COVID-19, especially when we have underlying liver disease in our patients to, uh, to share with our uh, members and uh, doctors in Asia Pacific region and around the world. Thanks for the initiation from Professor Bayawar from um, the Philippines and Professor Lau from Hong Kong who initiated the task force. And um, we have, um, we have 18 members of our task force. Uh, Professor Lau is the chief, uh, is the head of uh, our task force, and Professor Omada, Professor Bayawar, and Professor Sarin are among leaders of this task force in order to get to the guidelines and to uh, guide our, our, uh, our society. Uh, by the way, as mentioned er earlier, this is the second uh, episode of webinar where well, we're going to have a um, presentation from Professor Maso Omada, uh, who got to present about the uh, COVID-19 experience in Japan. We also host our webinar over our website. For those of you who are interested in studying the, uh, the, um, uh, the experience of uh, this present uh, presentation, you can have a look at that. And moreover, during the session, there could be a Q&A after the end of the session. You can chat your questions and also comments under the chat box. So we can try to answer your question after the presentation. Lastly, the COVID-19 is fast moving conditions. Professor Sarin has initiated the COVID-19 um, uh, register called AppCollect study to gather information that but to become a rapidly accumulated. So all of you are welcome to participate in this study. And lastly, I would like to um, invite my co-moderator, Professor Jin Mo Yang, to introduce our presenter, presenter uh, of today. Professor Yang, please. Yep. Thank you for joining the second APAS COVID-19 webinar. Now, as you know, COVID-19 is not only a global disease, but is still spreading around the world. We heard about China's experience with COVID-19 at last several session. In this second session, we invite Professor Omata. Professor Omata is so famous that everyone well known. I introduce him briefly. Professor Omata has made an effort to revitalized the apostle with Professor Sarin and others for the last 10 years. He's a co editor in chief of the Hepatology International. As you know, he got more than 1,000 liver related English papers. Now, he's the president of the two hospitals at Yamanashi, west of Tokyo. Today, his title is who have saved the first American from COVID-19. We'll have a Q&A time after the lecture. Professor Omata, please. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, Dr. Yang. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Tawandi. Uh, we would like to present our experiences in this uh, seminar number two. And uh, I'm basically not an uh, uh, infectious disease but, uh, specialties, but uh, because I'm uh, sitting as an uh, administrator and also the, uh, the hepatologist, uh, this is uh, the virus infections and we hepatologists know a little bit about it. So in that context, I may start my uh, talk. And uh, we have several experiences for the uh, last uh, almost uh, two months. The 
responsibility myself and my hospital is uh, Dr. Yang uh, introduced. We have to cover the areas of 80,000 population, the county called Yamanashi, west of Tokyo. We are very busy hospitals. And how the experience of this COVID-19 started, I will explain. Diamond Princess is a beautiful cruise ship. And the WH report, station report about the Diamond Prince told us that from the end of January to the end of February, there were 3,000, there were 3,711 passengers and then 712 infected. I'm almost 20%. And of those 712, uh, 712, 12 died. And this is ended in the end of the February. But on 2-11, February 11th, Japanese government decided to send two Americans, one Chinese and one Japanese to our hospital, 150 kilometers away from the seaport of Yokohama. 2-11-2020, this is a 75-year-old gentleman, came with this chest XP. And CT that time was just like this. We don't have any patient at all by that time. All of a sudden, we have to deal with this one. And actually he walked in, but in two days, the gases went up. Could you see this? Uh, is that okay? Yeah, it's okay. In one or two days, the gases get very bad, so we put a ventilator. But for the next two days, almost three days, four days, wax and wanes, and then doesn't improve is, is, even with a ventilator. And 2.19 in the morning, we took a chest XP. That was consolidated and they could not exclude mucus sputa at all. So we decided to put the bronchoscopic drainage on 2.19, 12, 29 p.m. We, he's Americans and then that time no American died. So we are very much scared about that. But after the drainage, the gases improved and then finally he was saved. But wife was also infected. So the two patients, Americans, are in our hospital. And as Dr. Wang gave a wonderful talk a week ago, he stressed airway drainage, dislodging mucus. In fact, in our cases, it's not the mucus, it's a plaque. It's a very hardened material, viscid material from bronchial walls and mobilize secretions and mucus from smaller to larger airways where the patient can clear the, the cough by coughing or suctioning. And it happens because after the bronchoscopic drainages, the patient can give a lot of mucus sputa. They improved. About three weeks after, still there are some remnants, but uh, he's totally okay. 75 years old. However, in Japan, this is just the beginning. Again, double WH report on Japan. We had the patients at the beginning from Diamond Prince. But after it's over, February and March, it started.
rising. The Korea was this time, you know, Koreans are battering this the virus during this time, and the China is the same. But that time we are not having a serious. I, I'm not saying we are not considering seriously, but basically, we seems people are thinking we are okay. And in fact, last few days is a peak, but I, I hope it can be a peak. I don't know, frankly speaking, because yesterday 200 patients in Tokyo is the highest. And today 580, ah, yes, sorry, tomorrow, ah, yesterday, sorry. So uh, you never know this is a peak or just one small, you know, next peak is maybe coming, we don't really know. And in fact, 700 cases a day, I remember that in China, for about 3,980 or something, one day is the biggest number. So in terms of the population, the China is 14 times or 13 times bigger. So per capita, per population of the, of the countries, the 900 is the biggest ones, maybe. I, I mean, I don't know much about the Europe, but uh, scary. So myself, well, what we have tried first is we try to set up COVID assays. We started 129, that time no, no COVID, COVID infection yet. But as you know that we have been doing these things about hepatitis, A, hepatitis B, C for many years. So we struggled that. And in fact, we created the double cancer method which is the, the Japanese official NIID uh, primers, uh, Takuma primers is a single quenchers, but we put the two double quenchers, Z, try to reduce the backgrounds and then able to reduce the background noise. The reason why we have this is because we are expecting to have the, the antiviral treatment just we had in the SCB. We, I want to see the declines, rapid declines, how many log reductions. So we want to have an accurate measurement, not just a positive negative TCR. And in fact, we compare these primers and CDC, we are able to get that too from the United States. So we compare the different, uh, seven different primers and the amplicons. And this is actually targeting the different places of nucleic acid capsid regions. And YCH, YCH is ours. And then targeting, and there are two targetings, N1 and N2. And CD, CDC has a, one extra ones and then Amplicon of the CDC is smaller compared to the, the Japanese NIID and the our size is intermediate. But our place is targeting exactly the same as the uh, NIID. CDC has three. And then after so many testings, now conclusion is simple. Best primer or the target is N2. We never had the N1 positive alone. When you have a positive uh, test, N2 always, and the N1 is less sensitive. So I think uh, maybe N2 alone might be okay. And this is the dilutions. In other words, try to see how much, how little we can find out the COVID-19, and then dilute it from 10,000 to 10 copies. And you can see the pinkish one, is our double cancer primers. And in here, using the virus uh, the diluted by water, the two of the, uh, the, the pro probes able to detect the virus, and the other uh, diluted by human uh, negative controls. Again, this N2 probe of YCH could detect the viruses. So we can, by this, calculate the, the virus amount, just like we did for the SCB. And then about the treatment, of course, Chinese colleagues has much more experiences, and I don't want to say much about 
because I don't want to treat many patients. I hope not. But since the um, patient is coming, every single one, I hope they can be cured or as soon as possible cured, could be cured. So we need extra the treatment, of course. I don't want to put the patient into the ventilator. I mean, I had a very scary experience on the Americans. I'm not talking about the Trump, but <laughs> that time, no American died. So I really thought it's a bit scary. And treatment, there is one paper came out. The, this virus has a very unique spikes all the time you show the pictures. And they fuse with the cell membranes and then, then they get into that. And then TMPRSS2, serine protease is the one cutting and then fusing and the spikes and the cell membrane fused and the virus get in RNAs. Then this cell membrane, this cell paper, paper in the cell said, this cell uh, protease inhibitor, the candidate is camostat mesylate and then blocks TMPRSS2 activities. And they are, has been approved in, the, in Japan for human use. It was published in the cell 2020. Uh, and actually this drug is so, so familiar to us. In fact, we are using for the, this one for 30 years for chronic hepatitis. I don't think it does work, I'm not sure. But uh, uh, that means uh, no side effects at all. So we are using these uh, drugs for patients. And of course, this is a protease inhibitor. So you remember, we, what do we do for hep C? We nucleoside analogs combined with the protease inhibitors. So we have to have the protease inhibitors and we have to have the uh, chain terminators. <clears throat> so combination hope, we, I hope, do something better for the, for the viruses. I have several experiences, but I don't want to talk about that because uh, rapid declines maybe depends on the phases. So I think uh, by looking at that, and actually measuring those viruses, I think the trials, clinical trials, very tough because what phases, you know, increasing phases, plateau phases, declining phases, the, the impressions of the effects might differ. So I think earlier the better, of course, and I want to see many patients in the phase of the climbing, escalating, increasing the increasing virus amount, and then whether they can really cut that virus amount down. But once you put in the declining phase, in the later phase of infection, I don't think you can show the much significant difference. But let's see. Anyhow, I, I repeat, I don't see the patient. I don't want to treat the patient. But if they come, we have to do things. And then let's go back to our 80,000 population situations. In March, we had only seven patients in our community, surrounded by the mountains. I can take a look at the Mount Fuji, and it's a nice place. And uh, but uh, till the middle of April, there are 30 patients altogether. Our community has. 37 patients experience. And of those, uh, majority, uh, not really majority, 20 to 30 percent we are taking care of. Especially, we receive the patients who have some troubles or problems to be cured. Then they transfer to us because we are the, the main center of the, the, the general hospital to take care of this, these patients. So as you are experience tell you, the milder case is really mild, I mean, so mild. But the severe case is, is totally different as I show you. So I think we have to, uh, we are responsible for the severe ones, but frankly speaking, prevention is better than nothing. And there are uh, people waiting by ECMOs and the ventilators, but I don't put the patient into that stage. And hope, uh, fortunately, up till now, we treated uh, 15 patients, and the only one that just I mentioned went to the ventilator, others okay. 
but now we are struggling with this 90 year old lady and also several others and uh, we'll see and then staff involves uh, all the members not the ju just the doctors all the people and uh, thanks enough we got a uh, uh, the kind of the encouragement uh, small postcard from the United States and the appreciation for the our job to do every day and they, especially they express thanks to everybody nurses doctors lab technicians housekeeping x-ray technicians who service nurses aides, administration surgeons sterilization technicians to technician social workers everyone else so she knows they know i mean this is not a matter of just uh, infectious people or the emergency people whole hospital have to handle this matter and then i think uh, i want to learn from the china i want to learn from the colleagues in uh, apaso about this and uh, i think uh, this is the last uh, session we have to win anyhow i mean how can you tolerate this one for the next uh, several months but uh, you know uh very tough every day i expect things so i'll stop and then let's have some discussions thank you very much Thank you, Professor Omada, for your excellent cover on the experience of um, treating the patient uh, in, in, in Japan. Uh, uh, do we have uh, questions from the audience? Um, while we're waiting for the questions, uh, let me ask our moderator, Professor Yang, do you have uh, any experience in treating COVID-19 patients in, in Seoul? Uh, as I told you, the professor, as I told you, uh, I didn't meet uh, COVID-19 patients because uh, um, my hospital is uh, not the uh, main, not main hospital. Just uh, I heard uh, from the uh, uh, another classroom member who works at Dago area. There's uh, some some patients is uh, but I. See B and hepatitis C, but in the as you know the COVID-19 uh, patients is a uh, main target organ is the uh, lung and the uh, heart. But liver is uh, some some elevated the uh, liver enzyme. Liver enzyme. This, uh, in hepatology field is uh, the major site of uh, from the COVID-19. Uh, thank you. Uh, just to share you uh, from uh, the experience from uh, Bangkok. Uh, actually, actually, I'm in the uh, uh, university hospital. Most of the COVID-19 patients in Bangkok go to, uh, go to infectious disease hospital. Uh, in our hospital, there are totally uh, 110 uh, 10 patients, COVID-19 patients. Ten of them require res uh, uh, respirators. And we got... Uh, uh, a few of them, two of them, one in fact uh, co uh, uh, underlying disease of uh, hepatitis B uh, treated with uh, TAF and another one alcoholic liver disease. Both of them had elevations of the enzyme but did not go to the decompensation and both of them uh, resolved from COVID-19 safely without any decompensation. And for those who require uh, respir uh, respirator uh, treatment, uh, I, I mean, uh, positive pressure treatment uh, 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 many weeks, but none of them uh, die so far. Uh, uh, seven of them now removed from uh, respirator and, and, and sadly back home, just about three of them still in the hospital. Uh, Professor Omada. Yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Yeah, there is a question regarding PPE were used by the staff in the early cases. Did any healthcare workers get infected in your hospital? Well, we actually we have 1,500 employees, but none so far, luckily enough. 
that's most various, uh, I mean, that's the things that uh, we are doing, every single thing. And then we decided every new admission patients, we do PCR before they cut in. But uh, employees, 1,300 plus 200 uh, newly ones. So very difficult to screen everybody. But uh, like uh, Korea, we better increase the number of PCR, no question. Otherwise, it may come sometime, but so far, no. None of them infected. And that, that is a uh, question from Professor Jeffrey, uh, Rasim, Rasim Jeffrey, uh, re, uh, uh, asking Professor Amara regarding the, uh, the problem associated with, with uh, liver patients. A any, any specific problems in COVID-19 patients? Uh, you know, none of the patients has any viral hepatitis or cirrhosis yet. But uh, quite, uh, I mean, I only saw uh, 11 or 14 cases, but the uh, transamine is elevated, but uh, no liver, I mean, decompensation or anything. Just uh, we have to protect the infections, uh, the house staff, our members, very cautious. So it's not just uh, ordinary infections. I mean, because if the house staff infected, they have to take a quarantine and be away for two weeks. So that's destroy our activities totally. That's the most care, as, uh, you know, worrisome things. And I don't see any suffering from the decompensation because I don't have the patient co-infected to HBSCD so far. Question, question from Professor Sarin um, regarding the, the, um, the the patient in, in Tokyo, did you recall whether they have any relation with the diamond chip or any different oh, yeah, yeah. phylotype? Yeah, yeah, it was. And, uh, but it's ended because that's uh, from January to February. And as I told you, until March, there is no elevation. There is no breaks, outbreaks, but then the middle of March, it got started. So it's nothing to do with the Diamond prince, Princess. But uh, came from uh, mostly that time, we, genetically speaking, it's from Europe. So beginning from uh, Chinese, uh, uh, I mean, the Diamond Princess, then does not make a break out. But now it's coming out. It's mostly I think from Europe, because Europe has a big problem. <clears throat> and uh, Professor Lau just asked uh, Professor Amada whether do you have any data on viral kinetics over the time or any correlation of viral kinetics with the IL-6 or ferritin um, during the course of infection? I don't have any data on IL-6, but <clears throat> I do have some data on the log reductions, you know those things, HCB people. One log per day is average. And then it's very quick, but uh, natural causes, as I told you in the lecture, natural re reduction can be also one log per day. So I, I repeat, I want to have, I don't want to, but I want to see <laughs> how it has an effect when the virus increasing. So that's maybe just before the uh, symptoms appears. And then I think that's the best way. Maybe I do, uh, we should have many screenings and then do PCR. Oh, and maybe, uh, maybe just only your center that, that then uh, do the viral kinetic, right? We, we, you, you can have the semi quantity, so called yeah, semi quantity. Yeah, we, we can do that. Yeah. But because most uh, of the center, we just have just all and on positive and negative. Hmm. Right, exactly. But you know, you, if you do the PCR, a uh, cycle, number of the cycles is very important because uh, official laboratory, Japanese laboratory have to give a positive negative alone. And then for the two, uh, ye actually yesterday we are having uh, positive, you know, patients, but we repeated and it was negative. Then I heard about the CT, a cycle threshold, it was 49. So I think uh, that's 49, 50, 38. Uh, I mean, we have to be very careful because PCR is not uh, uh, 
qualitative test. It's a quantitative test. People don't understand that. So that's, you got to get the impression that uh, how much the virus can be. And when you use super spreaders, it's 10 to 8 or 10 to 7. And in fact, we have the patient, that kind of patients. So people talking about the super spreader is not the immunological things. It's just simply the quantity of the virus is so different. You can imagine the 10 to 8 and 10 to, 10 to 2 is so different. And if you have count the cycles, if you, you know, you have a slopes up at the cycle 18, and if you have cycle up, uh, cycle uh, maybe 40, there is a 20 times cycle difference, which is uh, almost uh, a medium the differences. So you have to see the Tuckman's uh, cycles, curves, and then where the, they are. And in fact, by knowing that, when you read the checks, chest XP, and then even though it looks severe, but the virus amount is low, maybe it's a late phases and the normal damages can be recovered. But if in the early phases, and the same extent of the damages by chest XP, you may be, you must be very careful, especially the senior people. So we are correlating the virus amount and then judging the phases <coughs> of the infection and then see the X-ray and read the X-rays. That's what we are doing. And, uh, and this is that uh, maybe uh, any of you can, um, whether can, can uh, may, uh, answer whether the nitrosoxanide, ivermectin, the, the um, um, broad uh, spectrum anti uh, uh drugs. Is there any um, uh, data on ivermectin on treating COVID-19? Uh, no, not for me, but maybe some other participants may know about that. <clears throat> uh, um, I'm not sure whether uh, any of our apostle committee uh, has uh, data on this. Um, uh, the, the doses of Camusilase, uh, the series for the S inhibitor that you mentioned uh, in the in the treatment, the, uh, what was the dosage and, and the duration of the six treatment? Tab <clears throat> six tablets a day. That's all I know. <laughs> that's just commonly we use regular dosage. It's available. It's a generics. You can have that anywhere. And is it required that your, the chest? Uh, people in, in your hospital to perform bronchoscopy uh, for a, a drainage in, in, in this case? It, 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 I mean, uh, they're going to uh, uh, be afraid of the uh, <coughs> aerosol? Uh, yeah, you know, Dr. Wang, uh, actually, <coughs> I found uh, the message in his talk. I, I was so impressed because if you see the patients, there are several ways to try to excrete the sputum but couldn't make it. And also they are infected. So the, the, the nurses and doctors, everybody have to be very careful about under the conditions, how to try to make a prone position and things like that. But um, so that again, the bronchoscopy by itself is very, very, I mean, scary procedures. So should not do so often, but uh, our staff did it. And then once you stuck to the ECMO, I think, uh, you know, I don't know. Even though you preserve the, the, the lung, the same as the, the liver, if you don't have a repair, regenerations, forever. So I think uh, very similar to the subacute hepatic failures and this senior people is not able to regenerate. And they, have you ever had the term CPE? CPE is a very classical biological term side passage effect. In other words, <clears throat> if the virus inside replicate number of particles grow, then explode, and then damage, and then break the cell membranes. But like uh, HB virus, it's not a side passage. But this virus is a really side passage effect. So in the American case, we are afraid he did have the hemopathesis, bleedings. Then that was, do you have a bleeding in influenza? I'm not sure, I don't think so. 
So this is really breaking down the cell damages, all the lining cells of the alveoli. Then young ones may recover if you put on ECMO, but senior, senior one is not able, like subacute hepatic failure. So that's what it is, at least my experiences. And, and in Japan, what is the criteria for discharging the patient? And how many times PCR negative until the patient is <coughs> discharged? That's a very question, good question <coughs> because <coughs> antivirus, <coughs> it's not so obvious to for the life saving because as I told, when they did the, beat, uh, the job, the virus is gone, only waiting the repairs or the regenerations. But maybe there is a kind of sluggish type of the patients, you know, repeating a PCR 1.5 log, 0.8 log, going back to 1.2 log, and they fluctuating, but the subsiding slowly. In that case, maybe some of the antibiotics may work to hasten the discharge. I think that's one way. So maybe you can divide the phases into three phases. And then the drugs can do something for the, the on the ventilator. I doubt it. I mean, you know that subacute hepatic failures, antiviral no use. And do you have any experience on lambda severe in in Japan? No, I try, but uh, not for me. I I try as early possible. Actually, NIH people came very early, but that time. Uh, I couldn't use it. I don't know how the experiences some of the participants may have. And then judging the, what I said, it, even though it declines, could be natural causes, overcome the, that problem. I wonder. And after the uh, epidemic of COVID-19, uh, how about the routine um, uh, for example, endoscopy or uh, an every uh, uh, elective endoscopy, uh, 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 that uh, does it change uh, for the operation? Actually, the first patient is a 211, and they are still in Japan waiting. Maybe they are the only Americans still in Japan from the Diamond Plains. But we are doing everything. I mean, we do, we do uh, endoscopes, of course. Uh, so, so you 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 mean your your life doesn't 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 change? You don't have to. Well, that's another question time. I want to ask. You know, immune neutralizing antibody present, of course, with the immunochromatography and the IgG positive, but I don't know, no guarantee. But uh, Doctor Wang answered last time. You know, very high titer IgG may mean the neutralizing antibody and the immune to this COVID nineteen. But uh, that's um, my experience, so limited. Professor Yang, do you have any more questions uh, to ask Professor Omada? Uh, it's, uh, I see the, the Q&A, the Professor Kao, how many digital patients turn to be PCR point again in Korea? Is uh, just 140 patients is uh, PCR point again. But our government say the uh, the infectivity maybe the uh, of course is uh, now uh, uh, working, but the infectivity is uh, lower even though the PCR point for gain. Yeah, that indicates it's a small amount, and then you got to be very careful with the PCR. PCR doesn't mean there is a virus uh, live; just the nucleic acid presence. That's all. So the, maybe, you know, the, uh, the dogs or cats carry the nucleic acids and they can become positive. Not necessarily means they are infected and infectious. So PCR is a tricky one. I've been doing from 1989 and uh, be very careful about the interpretations. We need uh, antigen assays, EG ones, and then antibodies, neutralizing the antibody assays. IgM is not helpful for the early diagnosis, that's just like uh, our experience the same, just like Dr. Wang said. So I, I you know, we need a very easy test. And then in that context, the Korean did a lot of PCR. So how did you do? When you have patients, 1,000 patients, 2,000 patients in a hospital, 
uh, the not only the patient but uh, administrative people. How did you do that PCR for government employees or whoever? So many news, you know, somebody got infected. 70% of the hospital people got infected. How, do you, how did you handle in Korea? I want to hear that. Uh, well, you have uh, hospital staff might be also infected, right? Yeah. Uh, in Korea, the, is a, in terms of uh, uh, healthcare workers, is uh, just uh, one hospital is uh, yeah, BT, the COVID-19 patient, but the one hospital is uh, no infected uh, is, uh, healthcare workers. And another hospital is uh, one patient uh, BT, the uh, hospitals, there's uh, many uh, patients developed uh, with uh, COVID-19. The, the reason is, uh, the, uh, I heard uh, from the, uh, the, my colleague, the no more uh, COVID-19 patients is uh, due to the mask. So the uh, barrier is uh, uh, one of the key is uh, for reduced uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. Mm. But, uh, you know, how the USA, USA, America can tolerate that condition? I don't really understand that. I mean, it's a terrible situation. And then I, we are very scared about that because still it's going up. So I'm worrying about the patient, but also I'm worrying about our employees, my employees, pretty much. And then trying to the, 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 doing the best, which I can think of. Yes, I think uh, in, in, in Thailand, there, there are a few of them got infected as, uh, as a healthcare worker. But in, in our hospital, unfortunately, we don't have any that, care, that case uh, to take care of about 110 cases of COVID-19 patients. We don't have any health, healthcare worker infected with COVID-19 so far. Uh, and there is, another, uh, there is another question regarding the concerns of the patient with underlying chronic, chronic liver disease as well as those with HIV positive uh, who got infected with COVID-19. Uh, I'm not sure whether any of our, uh, our panel will have any data on that. Whether we, we uh, how we should deal that uh, situation in the patient with chronic liver disease or the patient with HIV on anti-HIV treatment who got COVID-19 infection. Uh, in fact, uh, um, uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we have uh, opportunity to, the, to look at those patients uh, with chronic liver disease and have COVID. Uh, and we have just uh, uh, got the paper submitted, but uh, suffice to say, uh, patients with uh, underlying or pre-existing chronic liver disease uh, run a uh, higher risk of liver injury um, uh, probably is because of the, the cytokine uh, response uh, associated with the COVID-19. Um, and uh, there are also, the, uh, uh, we observed one case with uh, acute or chronic liver failure, uh, which turns to be very bad. But then on the other hand, uh, chronic liver disease uh, also the enhanced um, the disease, uh, rate of disease progressions and getting the patients uh, sicker and uh, have a more and uh, a longer the viral shading time. And I think that uh, our data is preliminary and we need more data. And that's the reason why the, uh, Professor Sarain is initiating uh, the monkey survey. And hopefully we will be able to gather uh, enough information and more solid uh, suggestions uh, the, of the role of chronic liver disease uh, in uh, COVID-19 and also in other the respiratory the infections in the future. Any more questions? Just to echo what Professor Lau just mentioned that uh, uh, you are all invited to participate with the uh, up college, uh, the, uh, the APASO COVID-19 registry. That's going to be very easy to, um, uh, I, I try to share the, um, my, uh, just to go to the uh, survey monkey, the up -college study, um, uh, it, it takes um, just a few minutes to complete and every one of you uh, are 
invited to participate in this registry that could be initiated by Professor Sari. Hopefully in Asia Pacific countries, we can have um, data gathering very quickly in order to look at whether how COVID-19 going to affect our, uh, our river patients. Any more comment or question from the panels and from the Apostle members? Uh, one thing to add is uh, uh, I think that um, uh, we are also having the uh, data to suggest uh, underlying uh, fatty liver has an impact on the uh, COVID disease progressions. And uh, I hope that uh, we would uh, include the data such as the body mass index because we know that uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases uh, is increasing in prevalence, especially in the Asia Pacific regions. And whether this is affecting the, um, the outcomes of COVID-19 that needs to be understood. Uh, our group has uh, recent uh, uh, publications in the Journal of Hepatology uh, 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 bring up the preliminary the discussions on our observations that patients uh, with a higher hepatic steatosis index uh, runs a higher risk. And so it's a part and parcel of the chronic liver disease scenario. Uh, where the fatty liver itself has additional risks that need to be understood. And that's the reason why we need the larger database uh, to really uh, examine uh, um, the various risk factors uh, uh, with chronic liver disease uh, in the field of uh, COVID-19. And I hope that uh, uh, if you have these cases, uh, please enter your data uh, into the, this uh, uh, APCOLIS uh, studies, uh, which is very important in the Asia Pacific region. I think there are, there are many questions left. We, we, we try to collect all questions and, and then try to answer uh, even after the presentation. And, and then you can have a look at, uh, at the websites of the Apostle uh, uh, as well as the record of this, this presentation. Every presentation going to be recorded and will be linked to the web of the Apostle. For, for those of you who are interested in the, uh, in the uh, presentation can look at. Uh, any more comment or question from the Apostle members or and uh, from Professor Omada, Professor Yang? So well, one uh, question is uh, what preparations are being made in hospitals in Japan in anticipation of uh, major outbreak? Yep. So this question is uh, from Professor Strasser. So Omada, please. Sorry, I, I, I missed that uh, about uh, hospital infections. What, what, what's about? Sorry. Yeah, it's a uh, hospitals. It's an mm. uh, anticipation of a major outbreak. Well, there are several reports, but uh, I think uh, whether it's in uh, hospital or it's coming from outside. Uh, not many papers or not many data from Japan about whole genome sequencing. So we may have to do things to, to see where they come from. And then unless you know where they come from, how can they prevent? So, so far, you know, have to increase the number of PCRs you did, like uh, Korea, you just uh, did in the patients or the people in the car and they put the stick into it. So we have to increase the PCR numbers and then have to see who carry the viruses. That's the most important thing I personally think. But Japan is not quickly doing that, just like the Korean did. In Korea, is, uh, our hosp many hospitals uh, that enter the only one gate. Mm. To the, uh, uh, enter the hospitals, just the only one gate. Check the uh, by temperature and uh, check the uh, travel experience and so on. So it's uh, some reduced uh, 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 outbreak. Yes. And then moreover, nowadays, for the, in case of uh, in admission patients, he, they, they must uh, check the, uh, the coronavirus by PCR. Right. 
where we can close our hospital by any means. We are the last centers. We got to do it. So I'll do the best. Uh, please pray. Uh, maybe last questions that uh, just uh, to both of you, Professor Omara and Professor Yang, regarding the physical distancing. Why, why the PUI, the pe uh, pers person under investigation, uh, un under investigation, waiting for the PCR result? Uh, so, so in in your hospital setting, how far apart each individual can can be? You. Uh yeah 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 just uh, <laughs> i don't know because it's a is a in, in part is a part of infectious in, infectious disease <laughs> sorry i i didn't check it yeah. usually and uh in in my hospital we um we can keep we can keep the patient about two meter apart uh in a in a waiting room uh and and in case that we ha we have no, uh, enough uh, uh, individual room, but but in in case of waiting room, we have about two two meter apart. It takes about four to six hours to get the result for the PCR. Yeah, it's uh, usually nowadays is uh, very fast. So two uh, four four hours, uh, it, it can we can get the result. So. And then, and then, yeah. but as you know, the, in, the, in, in the hospital, there is no uh, social distance because it's busy. <laughs> <laughs> only, only check, uh, uh, they must uh, check the, the only uh, one gate uh, to enter the hospital. Yes. So if there is no more questions, but by the way, if there is uh, there are questions left, we try to answer the question after the, the webinar. Uh, so and we got to call this session end because we we are behind the schedule already. So thank you so much, for Professor Masa Omada, for your sharing of the experience of treating COVID nineteen patients. Professor Yang, Professor Lau, for sharing for uh, uh, Professor Lau, you have such a lot of data regarding the, the study and the information on COVID-19 pa patients. Uh, Professor Yang from Seoul to, to, to moderate, co-moderate with us uh, today. So, and thanks all the audience to um, participate in this webinar by, organized by the Apostle. Uh, we're going to have this kind of webinar every week uh, at 4 p.m. Beijing time. Uh, so stay tuned for next Saturday. Uh, very interesting. So I think many of your questions that you asked today are going to be answered by next week regarding the effect of COVID-19 at the liver injury. That's going to be presented by uh, the, among the, maybe the most uh, experienced uh, 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 hepatologists in this field. Stay tuned for, for our uh, next webinar. So without for, uh, further questions, so I, I would like to call this session, this webinar end, and see you next Saturday. Okay, good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great.